Okay. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, getting your, your cars on the lot a little bit faster. Um, I'm Bart Wilson. I'm going to be moderating the webinar. And before we jump in, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, on the left hand, or excuse me, on the right hand side of your uh, computer, you have a control panel uh, that GoToWebinar uh, uses uh, to facilitate in, in this webinar. And what you'll see is there's some drop downs. Um, one of them is uh, questions. So I would encourage you to pop that collapse a collapsible window open and um, ask as many questions as you're going to have throughout the webinar we'll get to them at the end of the broadcast and so uh, there will be plenty of time for questions also uh, we're recording this broadcast it will be available to anyone who registered for the webinar you'll get it in email um, in addition we will post it on the community so if you want to start some conversations about some of your uh, pre-owned inventory uh, you know, issues or some of the successes that you're seeing in getting your cars on the lot faster, uh, we'll, we'll be able to do that there. Um, so let, let's kind of jump in on this. Uh, we've got Anthony Greenlaw and Anthony Martinez. So we're going to, from now on, go AG and AM to kind of keep that, uh, keep that uh, kind of level. So let's begin with Anthony Greenlaw. He's a 27-year vet of automotive. Uh, Prominently, he spent his time in fixed ops. Um, he was recognized by GM as a top performer for his success in the parts industry and holds certifications in customer loyalty management, change implementation, and process management. And prior to his career at Rapid Recon, he spent 24 years employed at a multi-franchise retail dealer uh, in a metro area. So this guy, um, he's going to be able to, to speak dealer, if you will. And then we have A.M. or Anthony Martinez. Uh, and prior to Rapid Recon, he has eight years in the Army as a combat veteran. And after that, eight years in home construction and quality control. Um, and then he, he ran a recon center serving three stores with over 1,200 vehicles a month. And he's certified in both Lean and Six Sigma. And he used those practices to reduce waste in the home building industry, manufacturing quality control, and automotive fixed operations. And he has reduced the average days in recon for stores under three days while reducing costs and increasing growth. He's been featured in Automotive News, Fix Stops Magazine, and has been used in multiple test studies for process implementation and reduction in cycle time. So you guys are in good hands. Uh, without further ado, let me uh, turn the time over to AG and AM to talk about uh, reducing your vehicle recon time. Great. Uh, thanks, Bart. So today we're going to go through a few things. We're going to give you some takeaways here that you can take away and implement right away. Uh, we, we do work for Rapid Recon. You're going to hear us mention that quite a bit. Um, we, we've both been uh, um, prominent users of the tool before we came to Rapid, so we will mention it today, but we certainly wanted to give you some other items as well that, that you could implement in your store right away. Uh, this slide here, this is really a lot of the things that we see when a store approaches us. We've got bad communication and finger pointing things taking too long, bottlenecks, complicated workflows, where's the car, manual tracking, but what it all comes down to is wasted time. And, and that's why we're here today is just to help you, and you're, you'll hear me uh, mention this quite a bit today, help you address your non-value added time or managing your in-betweens. So with that, I'm gonna give this back to AM and he'll kind of walk you through uh, what we're gonna talk about here. So every store has a process and you need to identify how do you get to the front line? Do you have a standard process that you repeat? Uh, from our experience and working with our customers, we found that uh, this is the most common core process you see on the screen. Uh, we even use this process to track two different timelines or metrics, the entire time from acquisition to front line, time to line, and uh, a portion of that which is dedicated just to reconditioning. So what you see on your screen are basically the chronological steps that most dealerships uh, go through to get that car from trade-in, acquisition, from the auction or purchase, to the front line ready for customer. So here are the basic uh, reasons on why you want to get to the front line faster. You know, what's in it for you? What's the ROI? Um, there's some specific time wastes that we want to address today. And from our personal experience and uh, the th over a thousand systems and 
uh, industry research we have done, we found that certain acti activities take longer, and that's what we wanted to attack today to share these best practices with you on why you do want to reduce your cycle time of getting to the front line and how does that benefit you increasing your inventory turn fighting the market compression sales volume reducing holding costs your average store uh, for mainline brand is probably around 40 to 50 dollars a day so if you could reduce two days out of all of your cars you can imagine that savings or even increasing your inventory turn a reduction in about two and a half days gives you an entire inventory turn so where is that time and those bottlenecks being wasted and that's what we're going to try to go over today all right so let's talk a little bit about eliminating your non-value added time and and all of these these things we're going to talk about here are really managing to the new digital front line a, a lot of what we see in stores is is we've got a service manager or a director that that's saying, hey, we just got to get faster. So they go, they go back and they address this with the technician or the detailer or even the, the parts counter and say, well, I need you to turn that wrench quicker or I need you to detail that, that, that vehicle faster so we can get through more cars. And really, I've, we, we've never, I've personally never been in a store where when I left, the technician turned the wrench faster or the detailer cleaned the car quicker. What did happen was we help them manage that non-value added time. Where all that time starts to compile, it's when somebody pushes that car outside and then ends up waiting for it. Uh, we're waiting on somebody to make an approval, or we're waiting for somebody to make a decision, or we're waiting on a, or we're waiting on a part. The waiting is, is really where this comes into play. So before you go back and, and drag all your employees in and start beating them up because you don't think they're working fast enough, make sure that you've provided them with all the right tools to do their job with excellence so that when it comes time to hold them accountable, you don't have all of those excuses in the way. And those excuses are the non-value added time. And, uh, and what we mean by the non-value added time is what the customer is willing to pay for. Your customers have an expectation that the cars will be cleaned, cars will be fixed. They, there's even a slight expectation of the cost to actually run the business. But a customer doesn't expect to pay extra money for an RO sitting on somebody's desk. For someone waiting to even find out where the keys are and that that's there's no value added and that is complete cost to the dealer so that's what we mean by non-value added time the time spent and the money spent that your customer has no expectation of paying for right and and by customer you know we not only mean the sales department for you fixed people in there but also you know the retail customer the longer that vehicle sits the more the sales department starts to discount it so essentially that that retail customer is paying for that that non-value added time and and if it goes to waste you're, you're missing out on that money um certainly you want to position your, yourself to to uh communicate well to have full visibility on everything that's going on in your recon process and of course hold your teams hold your teams accountable uh, anthony is going to talk here about some pay plans that are actually tied to adr and you may have heard him mention this earlier i don't remember but ADR is an acronym for your average days in reconditioning. So obviously the reality of dealerships is people work to their pay plans. You know, it's hard to get away from that specific motivator. Uh, one of the more clever tactics that we've seen and, and both AG and myself were exposed to this when we worked at dealerships are tying your compensation to the actual time. I mean, that is time, uh, that is money that the dealership is spending. Therefore, you should have some skin in the game. I would even go so far as to say, replace any type of internal gross reward to the workers in reconditioning with a time reward. For example, set up some different tiers, maybe an under seven day, under five day, under three day. Now you've got everybody paying attention to that wasted time. And when uh, their pay plans are tied to it, you're gonna see them go above and beyond. You're gonna see those service advisors call the body shops, call those outside vendors. Hey, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Uh, same thing with technicians and detailers. You're gonna find that instead of pushing down, they're gonna be pulling down because they want that work, because they want that speed. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience, overnight, our dealership saved about half a day when we all went to uh, a pay plan tied to days. It also, believe it or not, helped with the relationship between sales and reconditioning when they realized that we're all on the same page here. We want those cars to the lot 
in a fast way so we can get some inventory turn. And it got rid of some of the finger pointing and, and suspicions of, well, you're just trying to fluff the ticket to make more money gross wise. So there's a couple benefits to that, but the main one is everyone's on the same sheet of music. Speed is of the essence. And you know, let's talk about how we all keep that information together. You do, you really do need a digital tracking and communication solution in your store. Um, you know, we'd love it to be Rapid Recon. If it's not, you you can look at at uh, other softwares out there. Um, but you you really need a way for the people that are closest to the action to be able to communicate effectively. If you've got a technician that's done with the car and he's running back to the service rider to tell him he's done with the car, and the service rider has to go in and you know, and update your Google Doc, which we see this so so often. Uh, how much time did you waste looking for bodies? So with, with the digital tracking and communication solution, the technician's able to log in and update that that immediately and immediately alerting the next people in succession that that, that vehicle's ready for them. Uh, and AG, on, to your point, oh, sorry to interrupt, yeah, but to your no, point about digital tracking, a lot of times people don't even know how long they are in their time because they're just tracking maybe an open repair order to close repair order. So it's not really until they start tracking stuff digitally that like to realize, oh, that's when it actually hit the lot. Oh, that's when we actually had it dropped off the truck. Now you're seeing really how long things are taking. Yeah, that's true. And and uh, that leads me into managing your in-betweens. So this is really common in stores, right? We We finish a vehicle in service and then we transition that vehicle to detail. So there's literally that vehicle leaving the service department and it literally exits a one department and then as it transitions into the other part, other department, we see or we hear, well, what's what's going on with that car? Oh, we're waiting to get it into detail or we're waiting to get it into service. These are the in-betweens. When we treat our departments like silos, we literally have silos. It's, it's no different than opening one door and closing another, but that car has to stop multiple times when we do that. Create an environment where, you know, even if you don't have the money or the real estate to have a centralized reconditioning center, treat it like you do have dedicated staff have a dedicated workflow so when that vehicle's done with service or when that vehicle's done with detail it doesn't go into a holding pattern to go into the next facility it's literally there and it goes straight in it goes right from detail to photos right from photos to service and there's no waiting or pending or staging obviously if you get behind you you know this isn't going to be 100 percent of the vehicles but you certainly need to treat it like it's the rule not the exception um, good, better, best parts options. Wow, the parts department typically is the last department to, well, I'm gonna say this this right and not hurt anybody's feelings, but they're the last department to be held accountable in reconditioning. And really the last department to look at themselves as part of the reconditioning team. But parts is so vital. With that uh, that daily holding cost, uh, you know, we might have somebody look up a part and it, it's three days out and, you know, what's the big deal? We push the car outside and now we've spent $90 or $120 just waiting for that part to get there. The 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 cheapest part is not necessarily the least expensive. If, you, if there's an aftermarket part that is two days out and it's only $5 cheaper than the OE part that's on the shelf, the OE part is $10 less expensive than the cheapest part because you don't have that extra uh, day of holding cost and you can get it on the car, you can get that vehicle out there right away. You need a, a rear parts counterman that's got the mindset to go, okay, this thing's five days out. I know we've got to get this car frontline ready and it's costing us 40, 60, $80 a day to keep it in stock. Is there another solution that could get this part on this car and get it frontline ready now? So, you know, more than just somebody sitting behind a computer looking up stuff and, and saying, do you want it or don't you? Yeah. Somebody that can get outside of the, uh, outside of the box. Uh, dedicated an, an, an approval process for, uh, for time management. So Anthony, I know that you've got AM, you've got some stuff to talk about there. I'm gonna turn that over to you for that. Yeah, you know, variance is just inviting problems. If everyone's doing something a different way, it's really hard to to, to keep the efficiency in that. And, and that's true with even two people uh, or three people. It, you really need to standardize the way that you present your approval process. If it is uh, the same person every time, that's even better. Uh, let's say it's the used car manager. That's typically what we find. Um, and when someone gathers an estimate and prepares one to send over for approval, make it look the same every single time. Make sure the people who are the approving authority are the ones immediately notified, especially if you can do it through, some, through a digital tracker 
or some something digital to where it's an instant notification, not just a casual dropped an RO off on your desk. But if the approving authority is seeing an estimate that looks the same for every vehicle, at least organizationally wise, then you can your eyes will go straight to what you're looking for rather than reading. 10 different people's handwritings, trying to decipher what did he mean by an oil leak or how bad was the dry rot on that tire. When you have a standardized way of presenting an estimate and standardized people of who's presenting and who's approving, you're going to really get a shorthand and understand the motives for both the decision making and the presentation. So we yeah. definitely recommend that. Anthony, I was just, I was in a store this week uh, out, out here in Utah, and uh, one of the, the complaints was, "Wow, it's it's just taking the used car manager too long to to make a decision." And I asked, "How how are you presenting the estimate?" Well, you know, sometimes he comes back and looks at the car. Sometimes I text him. Sometimes I call him, and sometimes I email him. Well, whose fault is that? <laughs> it's just it's so inconsistent that you can't pin that used car manager down to one thing. So you're absolutely right there, and and I saw it firsthand. Uh, on uh, on Tuesday when I drove out there. Yeah, and, and especially when I see people uh, handwrite, uh, you know, an inspection form or on the back of a repair order or something, you know, just to, the, the time it would take to decipher someone's hand, handwritten notes on what they mean. It just, to standardize everything makes it a lot easier uh, and actually more efficient. You're gonna save time. So Great. one of the most important business practices in regards to reconditioning is treating it as its own entity, managing recon as a profit center. And to do so, you have to have some type of dedicated process separate from service or sales or, or another department. You have to treat it like it's its own department. There is service parts and recon. And by doing that, not only will you have um, a separate process that everyone can streamline, but you should also include dedicated staff have a dedicated internal technician. That's all they do. Because if they're sharing work between internal work and the drive, essentially what you're doing is you're pulling off that technician from your biggest customer. And I'm speaking to uh, to service, fixed ops. Your biggest customer is the used car department. But you're pulling them off to handle an immediate customer in the service drive. Uh, to, and what you've done is you prolong the inventory turn for the entire store. So having a dedicated technician that isn't exposed to that and that can focus straight on that is going to speed up your process. And again, back to the previous comment, you're going to get that shorthand and comfort level that he's going to understand what that used car manager or the other approving authority is looking for. And now you've got even more of a chance of that car staying in the bay until it's done rather than being pulled back out and you know going through the uh, process of bringing in uh, retail work, et cetera. So here are some other tips that we have found. Have a chaser, okay? This is somebody that's a liaison between sales and service. Somebody that, that works for sales, reports to sales, but works back in service and reconditioning so that they can act as an additional approving authority, someone who can help the reconditioning department get the vehicles in, get the vehicles stocked in, and serve as that back and forth because obviously, Approving authorities are probably going to be busy managing sales staff, desking deals, et cetera. And to have someone dedicated full attention to internal work is really going to help out the reconditioning and or service department. Hey, the Anthony, can I jump in real yeah, quick? Yeah, uh, so, with, you know, with the chaser, people ask, well, when should we actually implement that person? I'm only selling uh, 30 vehicles a month. Where we typically see that, that, um, that chaser to be beneficial is right around the 100 vehicle mark. Anything more than that? seems to be you know way too much for a used car manager to, to handle while he's trying to desk deals go to auction and and do everything else so right around the 100 vehicle mark we'll see people implement a chaser and then back to anthony's you know, comment about dedicated staff um, we certainly have seen stores that have dedicated uh, technicians but those technicians from time to time have handled some overflow from the from the main shop it's not their primary focus the primary focus needs to be on that internal work um, but if your store is 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 that size where wow I you know I just can't take one full person and, and keep them dedicated to this all the time, um, it's okay to ha have them handle a little overflow as long as they understand where the priorities lie. Correct, and even if you can't have a dedicated uh, space or staff, just having a dedicated process and assignment could still mean a world of difference. You know, if you have John and Joe, John can be primary internal and then cover Joe on the retail when not done. So 
it's they're covering each other, but they have a primary source and they're not fighting over brand new tickets together. Uh, so even if you can't get the space for people, still have the process so that everybody knows oh, this is what the expectations are and this is how we're going to track vehicles as they now come through reconditioning. Uh, centralized recon to maximize your current process. Same uh, same principle uh, as we were talking about before. You know, treat it like its own entity. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, a internet department trade in or purchase or wholesale. Have the whole reconditioning process be its own dedicated process that all cars come through. There might be several inputs: the the trade ins, the purchases, uh, maybe something going through real fast because going straight to the auction. But having that dedicated internal process is really going to help out. Think of it like an assembly line. Detail variable work and pricing. Uh, this is where you really, you don't have a blanket detail for all of your cosmetic work. This is where you actually triage and treat the detail in the cosmetic work just like you would treat the mechanical work. And it'll actually speed things up by having variable pricing. You shouldn't have to pay the exact same amount uh, or in both cost of labor or the sale of it for a pristine purchased car versus a minivan that is eight years old um, and it's got you know children uh, crayon and gummy bears and all that you really need to have variable staging uh, some of the best scenarios that we've seen are pre-assigned staging with triggers where the detailers and the cosmetic department know exactly what they have to do just by looking at the inspection form and have a cosmetic inspection form if i know that i've got this van i know it's going to pay four hours and i'm going to charge sales this much money and just by knowing that, now that detailer knows how much time they are going to expend on it, they know what tools they're going to need by it, and they can actually dispatch it properly to whatever time's left in the day for the shift, rather than just pick up keys and grab and go whatever you can. So having those pre-assigned stages and triggers and, and variable detailing will really help speed things up, and your staff will make more money because they can turn more hours, and sales will increase their inventory because they're going to get that fast car they may have rotated to the next day because now someone saw that, okay, this is just a stage one detail. So uh, go ahead. I, I was going to jump in on this, this cosmetic recon thing. Is that, is that all right? Yeah, no. Yeah, please. Uh, so the, the last nine years of my, my career there at, at the, at the Metro dealer, I was actually running their collision center. So um, one of the things that I did was I internalized our cosmetic reconditioning and, and I took it full tilt. Now you don't have to go to quite the extreme that I did, but we were doing, uh, you know, touch up, paint repair, um, interior repair, uh, leather repair, you know, everything that was cosmetic. There wasn't anything that was that was outsourced to an out to an outs outside vendor. But some of these things are, are good profit opportunities for service and can help the car get done a lot quicker. Here's a good example, like rock rock chip repair. It's relatively easy to do. Um, you, you can almost train yourself how to do it. If you jump on Amazon right now and type in rock chip repair kit, your technician can buy a set uh, of, of tools to do this somewhere between a really good set between, you know, four and five hundred dollars. They don't even blink at at spending spending that on, on a, you know, a digital torque wrench. So uh, I know it's in their budget to do it and and, you know, to pay them an extra, you know, three to five tenths. Uh, to go ahead and fill those those windshield chips while while they're doing other work on the car and that and they got that UV light sitting on the windshield curing uh, it's just just more money in in their pocket and at the same time it's getting that operation done while that work is in there and they're and the the you know the variable department's not having to wait on a on a vendor to come in so something you should consider there for sure time wise that's crucial you it it's very frustrating to have a car completely done staged somewhere now aging with pollen weather snow or whatnot waiting on a vendor who only shows up twice a week uh or to have customers have to go back there to show it but if you could internalize that and have that done during the regular detailing process but with just a little bit extra training and just a little bit more of cost for labor now you, you've gotten to the lot two to three days faster and and what i ended up doing i actually ended up hiring one of our vendors um i i, I let him know look we're going to internalize this either way uh why don't you consider coming coming to work for me and he had the skill set for for paint repair, and I needed him to have more skill set for interior repair, for PDR. So I uh, I hired him and I sent him to school. I I think including tools, I spent about 10 grand on school and tools, and then I was probably another $2,000 in wages uh, that I spent while while he was there. The school that I sent him to gave me a retrain guarantee in case he did quit. I know that's in everybody's mind. Hey, I'm going to train this guy up, and then he's going to blow out and do his own thing. Uh, so the school gave me a retrain guarantee. 
that tech did end up leaving me, but he left it, left me five years later. I, I got a lot of uh, a good work out of him and uh, and the company that I sent him to uh, certainly honored the retrain guarantee. If you want to email me at anthony at rapidrecon.com, I'm happy to share that information with you. I have no affiliation with this company other than I used them. So um, it's not like I'm getting a kickback or anything. So I, I just know that they're, they're a great company and they were good to work with. So I'd be happy to share that with you. And you know maybe you can internalize some of this yourselves. And, and other great examples of that are uh, headlight restoration, odor removal, uh, PDR, like he mentioned, uh, some other touch up. Uh, we've even been exposed to uh, training or internalizing for new car add-ons, uh, spraying bed liners. So there are a lot of different options uh, with, with the right training and equipment just to keep the flow going. And I guess while we're while we're on that topic, not, not to beat a dead horse here, but um, we were doing about, at, at one facility, about 125 used cars a month. So it's not it wasn't a huge used car uh, reconditioning facility, but just in cosmetic reconditioning in one year, the net profit, net, to, to my department, on on just cosmetic reconditioning alone was over $130,000. And that was money we were already spending with vendors. So if, if that doesn't make you want to do something, I don't know what will. So here's a case study translating uh, time into money. So uh, using uh, Penske Automotive Central Region stores uh, that we worked with, uh, over the last two years, their entire group average from acquisition to frontline started at 10.31 days and was reduced down to 5.46 days, doing a lot of the things that we've been talking about today. So this saved them about 4.8 days per vehicle in that group. Now using the NCM 20's average holding cost of $40 a day, which is actually kind of light, times that 4.85, that's $194 of vehicle saved. That's ex If you extend that savings to the group's rate of sales, which is about 2,500, uh, units a month for the group you're talking about four hundred and eighty five thousand dollars a month eleven point six million dollars in the last two years so penske doing some of these best practices focusing in on reducing the time in reconditioning saved over over two years saved eleven point six million dollars and uh if if you're curious how this would impact your, your business, if you go to rapidrecon.com, there's a, there's a free um, cost calculation uh, calculator on there. Just go in and plug your numbers in there. It'll it'll actually g give you this this same data. But this is uh, real similar to how we came up with that data. This is the math behind it. Uh, if you want to know the exact math behind it, again, email me at anthony at rapidrecon.com, and I'll make sure that I get this over to you so you've got this in writing. We are also recording this, so you could always circle back to it as well. But yeah, hit the website and plug your numbers in there and, and you can really see what these extra days in recon are costing you um, personally at your store. So one of the main functions that we serve for our company is we are uh, performance managers uh, and we like to give consultation and best practice ideas and sharing and reviews uh, for customers or potential customers, whoever calls us or contacts us. And so we're going to share with you some of uh, our better best practices that we've seen and tested and we know that work. Um, one of the things I always like to preach is looks and make sure if you're tracking everything virtually or on a whiteboard or Excel sheet, you got to make sure the physical world is just as organized and, and matches that. One without the other is still chaos. So come up with a parking map, come up with an area stage label where things are supposed to go come up with maybe some signs this is an example um, of a google map where it was just labeled exactly where to park the cars so this serves a couple different purposes number one when you everyone knows where to put the car for what stage now as you're doing a lot walk you can actually tell where your bottlenecks are if you got overflow parking or park double parked cars on waiting on detail without even logging into a an app or calling somebody you're no you know right then and there okay we got to beef up detailing because we're falling behind and you can also figure out exactly the efficiency of where you parked how many times do you see your employees walking around carrying a fob in the air hitting that panic button because that mechanic doesn't know where that car was left for them to work on well what if you had an area dedicated to that and it could be very inexpensive to create this spray painting a stencil on the on the ground uh, 
Me personally, I preferred the signs. I'd put uh, cones up with poles going out of it and some temporary signs that I could move around so I could adjust based on the workflow, uh, how busy we were. But at least everyone knew to look for a particular sign on where to park. Great for vendors too. Great for sales staff as they're walking back there. Just by looking at the parking lot, now they can figure out the chances of a timely delivery. So the most important part of all of this is make sure you distribute this information. It's great to come up with it, but throw it on a map, hand it out to people, have the sales desk keep one uh, behind uh, the desk so that sales staff know where things go and all the porters know, et cetera. You know, we talked earlier about vehicles just uh, rolling from one department to the other and right in, right into that that next department. The reality of it is, it's that that's not going to be the case 100% of the time. So having a map certainly helps you manage those exceptions and and eliminate some of that non-value added time. Um, this here, this this example, th these are um, these are detail carts. Now, a company called Innovative Tools sells these, and uh, in 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 my store, one of the things that I did was. Uh, implemented a process where we loaded up these carts and we took the carts to the car. Uh, now, what we found was, this was back in 2016, late 2016, that uh, we were actually able to detail one more car per detailer per week with these carts because what's happening is the detailer is walking back and forth between the car and the cabinet that's at the wall or the bench. That may not seem like very much, but as many times as they have to go back and forth to grab another product, it adds up. It adds up quite a bit. It was actually a 9% increase uh, in efficiency. So it, it was it was a huge win. These carts are a little expensive. They're about $400. Again, not, I'm not affiliated with this company at all. I just know that this works. Um, I, I've, I've seen dealers go out and, and think they're going to save a little bit of money and they go down to Home Depot and they buy the Rubbermaid cart that I think is $100. Um, and uh, they end up with uh, you know, inadequate space. One thing about these carts is they are specifically designed for detailing. Um, if you look, a lot of the product is up off the bottom of the shelves. Like if, if your detailers do buff, the buffing pads are up off the ground. Um, they're, uh, they're made out of mesh. So, you know, when you put something like a chamois on here, it's not picking up all the dirt that, that was left there from the previous rag that was laid there. You pick a chamois up and put it on a black car, you're going to spend $400 real fast trying to get those those scratches fixed. So even though the card is a little bit more expensive, I would recommend uh... Hello? I'm here. Okay, so Anthony must have cut out. Okay, so um, I'll give you guys a pro tip. An advantage to using this cart and taking it to the next level is if you standardize where everything goes and your eye is just trained to look and see, okay, that many pads, that much chemical, that's where the towels go, et cetera. Now you've just cut down on your inventory taking time and your ordering time. So instead of having to call up or have people come up and request or giving people free reign to just hop on a supply truck and shop for what they need, then you get the invoice. Now you can proactively take charge of your supplies because you're not searching through people's boxes. You're walking down a line and you can easily see where, what you're getting low on and take a quick inventory. And that's kind of the same, that same principle of uh, the parking lot. If everything has a place and has a assigned designation, everyone is on the same sheet of music because there's a standard. So the next thing to talk about would be a workflow. So or your recon steps, you know, not just the standardized people and processes and maps and stuff, but literally the steps. Does every car go through the same process? Obviously, some cars can skip things, but generally speaking, like we showed you in that uh, picture in the beginning, that the timeline, Generally speaking, every car goes through some type of inspection, some type of mechanical uh, touch up or mechanical repair, cosmetic, and then prepped for the lot. Just make sure all the vehicles are following the same path. Uh, here's two examples of two different stores, uh, workflows that we saw, one a little bit more simpler on the left and one a little bit more specified. Uh, the one on the right uh, adds a little bit more accountability and don't be afraid of making uh, a step owner look you know detail belongs to John Doe he is my lead detailer or detail manager or whatnot and if cars are taking too long in that step I'm gonna hold you accountable 
again, kind of circling back. Now you add that extra accountability of possibly a pay plan or some type of performance reward for time. And now you have some standard to track if people are behind time, ahead of time. How do you have enough resources? If uh, the detailing or technical steps are always behind schedule, maybe you need to look in your scheduling. Maybe you need to look in hiring more people, et cetera. So, but you got to start somewhere. You don't know how bad you are until you start tracking it all. So these are two examples of workflows. And I think my mic is back on. Is it back on now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Uh, one thing we, I want to make clear is we're not suggesting that vehicles have to go from step one to step two to step three. Uh, it's pretty common. You might buy a car that's got a damaged fender. You know you can make a retail piece out of that. It's okay to take that car and send it to the body shop and get it fixed and then and then get it through detail and photos and then over to your service line. Um, it's okay to go out of order, but we, you know, Anthony was mentioning we like that standard so that we're making sure that we're capturing all this stuff. Nothing worse than getting a vehicle to the the front line and have it not be sensory ready. You know that thing might look like a, a shiny new penny, and you get inside. If it smells like cats, first person that sits in there is going to get out real quick, and you've already lost that turn. Mm -hmm. So th these are just some of the more popular ones uh, that we like to share, but we've got many more best practices. So feel free to contact us. Uh, some of these practices we can even show you uh, through a, a web meeting or, or like a digital demo, but others we can just explain to you on how we've seen them apply. You know, no two practices are always the same. Every store has a little bit of a different culture, different uh, management team, but uh, just the generic addressing of getting rid of that dead time in between the tasks, speeding up the, the I'm done, now it's your turn portion of the process is the world of difference. And, and that's really how those dealerships that went from eight days, 10 days, down to under three days, that's how they got there. They got rid of that dead time. So here's some more examples uh, for you. Again, contact us. Uh, uh, and we can go through these a little bit more detail and share some more. So, um, Bart, I, I, we've got a couple of other best practices in our pocket. We haven't shared them yet. We just didn't know where we were going to end up time-wise. Is this something you want to open up to questions now? Do you want us to take you know, you know three or four more minutes to uh, to share a few more things? What do you think? I, I think I'd love to. I Personally, I'd love to hear more of those best practices. I think uh, that would be a good use of our time. I say go nuts. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, there's a um, there's a Chevrolet dealer out of Phoenix, and I'm not going to name them, but you could probably figure out who they are. Uh, they have some of the very best average days in reconditioning and time to line times in the industry. But one of the things that they do is when that that vehicle comes in to service. So uh, when that vehicle is is turned over to the service department to be written up. The parts department's actually notified that that vehicle's there and they're given the RO number. Now, this hasn't been dispatched to a technician. It's no more than a service writer writing it up. There's a list of parts that this store replaces on every car. Um, now, you can determine what yours are, but theirs are uh, you know, oil, oil filter. Uh, I think it's in-cabin air filter, uh, wiper blades. So they, they, they call them the usual parts. Um, the parts department's notified when that vehicle's get, getting written up. They will go ahead and procure those parts. They'll box them and tag that box in, in a little tote, um, and they actually deliver that tote. Um, no, sorry, that not they don't deliver that tote because the the technician hasn't been assigned yet. But they put that tote on the rear parts counter. So when they uh, when they pull that vehicle in for service, all those parts are already ready. It's a huge time saver for the technician not to have to draw up a P and A on stuff that they're going to do on every single car, send it into parts, have them pull it, wait for it. You know they really got down to the point where they were cutting out minutes to save hours to save days. And and that's how they, they got down to, uh, you know, they're less than three days to get those vehicles done. It's just little details like that. So that's another best practice uh, you can utilize. An another one, this was actually something that, that, that I did. And uh, we were back looking at those detail carts. In fact, Anthony, if you want to back the slide up uh, too, we'll look at that one more time. So here, here's an idea. Uh, with your with your products, Anthony mentioned that you should have consistent products so that everybody's using the same products and you don't have one detailer using one type of compound, another detailer using another type of compound that's costly. In addition, if they run out of product, then you're running out of his favorite product. So, um, and, and by the way, the cheapest product is not necessarily the least expensive, just like with parts. Uh, I was a big 3M guy. 
uh, and, and used a lot of that because I knew the products would work and uh, with the right staff, you can train them to use less. But what, what I did is I had a little, um, almost like a, um, uh, like a five by seven index where you, all of the items that the, the detailer needed were listed in that, in that index. And as they ran out of those items, they would just pull that card out. And on that card was the number of their cart on the back and the product on the front. And they just threw it into a little box that was sitting on this cart. And then when the, the supply sergeant that would come around once a week or twice a week to fill that, rather than stopping the detailer and saying, what do you need? Or going through the cart and going, well, you know, what do you need here? He would just pull that box and take it back to his desk and then call the order in. And when the order would come in, he would, he would check it in. And, and literally he would have in his hand the item that the, the technician needed, the cart that it belonged to. And so he would stock that cart. And we, we never had to pull the detailer off to, to ask the questions. Uh, and that was extremely efficient. And they didn't run out. Boy, I mean, running out of a product, all the time that you would save by bringing the cart to the car, you could burn that up so quick by running out of something that's vital. So that, that's another best practice that's out there. I've, Anything? I've seen a lot of dealerships have separate processes for cosmetic versus mechanical. And a, a good best practice is to actually combine that instead of seeking approval from the sales department twice, have the fixed ops service portion in charge of the technicians also take ownership of the cosmetic, uh, train the mechanic to overlook the car to see what kind of detail the car is going to need or cosmetic repair the car is going to need include that in part of the inspection. Now you've got one bundled price that the used car department or the approving authority is going to look at and they're going to be able to give an answer and have an expectation of how much everything is going to cost rather than surprise later and challenging approvals versus repair order charges, et cetera, later. So having it all done right away and it, it's very easy. It's already on the rack. It, uh, these are trained professionals that can diagnose many, many problems. So to have them identify scratches, dents, or the severity of a wet sand uh, is really easy to do. Um, and I found that when you're able to combine that and give one sum total, do you want us to fix this car for this? It will be lot ready for this one price. You can streamline it. And then it can evenly, uh, easily go and flow between the mechanical phase and the cosmetic phase behind the scenes without interruption. And I know that uh, the, you know the Chapman Auto Group has, has done a really good job with this. One of the things that they did is they gave their inspectors or their you know their technicians a little bump to uh, to make sure that they're capturing that information. While uh, you know that technician's not going to sew up the interior, he's definitely noting it on the the multi-point inspection form that this is going to need some interior repairs so the used car manager knows what he's getting into. You know, and it was worth, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what their bump was, but, you know, whatever the, the two tenths, three tenths or whatever it was, it was definitely worth the extra money for variable to know what they were getting into before they, they sent that vehicle over to, um, to mechanical. Anything else you might want to bring up? Uh, well, I just want to say that in addition to uh, other best practices available. We also have a book that we can send out to anyone. Uh, our CEO and owner wrote a book on the best practices um, and different case studies and stories from other dealers uh, for, to, for time to line, for speeding it up and organizing it. Uh, and that's something that we can also provide for anybody if you just reach out to us. Uh, but besides that, I'm good unless, Bart, uh, anyone has a specific question. I know Anthony. By the way, this book is free. Uh, yes. You know, we'll pay. We'll pay to send it to you. So if you email me um, and, and give me your address, I'll, I'll make sure I get a book book out to you. So. And by the way, um, this wasn't just Dennis sitting behind a desk uh, sharing all of his knowledge. Now he he did quite a bit of that, but there's a lot of success stories from other dealers in here. So he went around um, to, to successful dealers and said. Wow, what is you know what what is your secret or you know what do you want to share? And believe me, dealers they they like to talk about it, which is awesome. Um, so the real life stories from real dealers uh, in this book. So you know uh, certainly take advantage of that and let us let us get you a copy out. Well, well thanks a lot, uh, AG and AM. Um, I I really appreciate this. Once again, for the people uh, on this on this webinar, feel free to hit that questions drop down on the right hand side in the control panel. And, and add your questions, but I've got I've got some, and I, I apologize. I tend to get in the weeds with a lot of stuff. Um, my background was on the sales side, so I expressed some of the frustration, uh, but it's, it's through that lens. So I'm going to try to to back out for a second. 
Um, you guys mentioned that you would tie the play plan, the pay plans uh, to ADR. Um, who would who do you think would you would tie those pay plans to? What job roles in the store? I would immediately tie that to whoever you hold accountable for the internal work uh, and the, and the reconditioning process. If you have a separate reconditioning manager or an internal service advisor, uh, I would definitely do that. And having said that, I would include them the entire process for accountability. That way you do have someone who cares enough to call that third party vendor outside body shop for recalls, et cetera, and not just that initial inspection. Uh, I'd be a little bit careful for specific to mechanics or, or detailers because you definitely want their motivation to be tied to the specific job in front of them but service and uh, advisors internal writers managers or maybe as a uh, department as a whole maybe as a spiff or bonus is, is where i would go with that the the people that can control those in-betweens mm -hmm. to include the role of the chaser that we mentioned that that way everybody kind of has the same motivation uh which is speed to get the those cars to the used car department as fast as possible. Now, uh, being a fixed guy, I don't know if this is a best practice, but I've heard of this actually uh, actually happening. Um, based on the uh, the average days in reconditioning, the sales department was actually paying a different labor rate <laughs> to the service department. Um, wow, you know, I, I personally I haven't experienced it, and I'm sure service managers are on the other end of this thing just. <laughs> just squirming right now that there's probably a sales manager out there going, yeah, man, let's do it. But I've seen it and uh, I, don't, I don't know if it works, but I'm pretty sure it does. Well, I, you know, you're, you kind of touched on my next question, but I'm getting in the weeds here. Uh, but what are the successful stores? How are they, how are they compensating uh, for ADR? Uh, well, I, I can speak, uh, Anthony can speak too, but the, the chaser that, that I had, um you know we had him on a little bonus so and the number the exact number is may not be may not be right there but it's very similar so uh anything less than seven seven days he was paid an additional 500 a month uh anything uh, less than five days it jumped up to i think 850 and then anything less than three days it went to two grand so it was huge a huge jump between that you know that seven day and that three day um and you know, the company looked at that as you know, money well spent. Yeah, very similar um, with internal advisors, managers, obviously uh, a higher level. Um, and you could also have some mitigating factors like uh, none of it applies unless 100 cars were sold. So that way you're not having your people profit off of a really horrible sales month, but a fast time kind of, you have to be watching both of those metrics. Um, we have examples of generic pay plans that we've seen and or used uh, available. So just like the best practices, if you want to reach out, uh, we can definitely do that. That's awesome. Do you want to flip back to that slide where you guys have um, all those resources, the, the URL? And I'm pretty sure it's not uber, uber secret or uber complicated. Yeah, but, but, but I know you guys had a slide where you, where you had some of your case studies. That was really cool. Um, so so you, you kind of hit on the in-betweens. Um, I'm going to ask a generally speaking question. Generally speaking, where do you see the biggest bottleneck for these in-betweens? Is it between? Is it the, before detail? Is it getting into the shop? I mean, where do you guys see the biggest problem? You you want me to jump in on that, Am? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So here's typically what we see, and uh, and I know that there's people in the audience that are going to recognize this. Uh, reconditioning is services problem. Wow. You, you know, you, you want a 12 to 14 day store. That's a good way to do it. So here's where, where we typically see that. Now, the service manager has been telling you for years that he's three days. You know, you're 15. Um, recently, probably within the last uh, 24 months or so, there's been a really big push for what we call T2L, which is time to line. And that includes the processing time for variable. It also includes the time for used car managers to make decisions. Um, a lot of where our bottlenecks are held up are getting that vehicle processed from trade and getting it over to service in a timely manner with keys. And, and Anthony hit on this earlier. Your your digital world, you know, your rapid recon world or whatever solution you decide to go with, needs to have a matching virtual world. When I tell you that vehicle's ready for you, the keys will be here, the car will be here, the paperwork will be here. That's that's his deal. 
it's Anthony Steele. And he, you know, he's real big on that and he pushes that a lot. Um, and, and that'll help out quite a bit from, from waiting. You know, the other one is the used car managers making a decision. I heard a used car manager earlier this week said, uh, told the service department, well, I'd like to pray on that for a day or so and I'll let you know. Well, they pushed the car outside and they pulled the next car in. Well, that, that used car manager made a decision later that afternoon, but when he made that decision, they already had another car pulled in and they were working on it. They're not going to just drop everything, push that car out and pull the one and you made a decision on. If you make them wait, that car's going outside, chances chances are really good. It's not coming back in for another day or maybe even two, depending on what they decided to stick back in front of it. So a little delay in a, in a decision here is a huge delay in that time to front line. Well, I really, I, and that's why I really like what you guys are saying. You've kind of quantified it. I've heard, I saw on your slides 35 and then, um, you know, I, earlier you mentioned the 40 to an $80 per day holding cost, and I'm sure it just depends on the, the value of the vehicle. But at the end of the day, you know, having a good, better, best option, um, like I, like the best part is X, but I have it. The good part is Y, but it's going to take me until tomorrow to get it. You know, just to have that in the back of your mind go, well, that's going to cost me, you know, 35, 40, 80, whatever the number is, dollars. Um, it might, it should help to make those decisions faster. Uh, versus that used car manager who, you know, but I work with them and I don't blame them, but this is like just save trying to save every dollar, but they're you know they're tripping over those dollars to pick up pennies sometimes when when think about what, how long it takes to get it out of the shop. As a best practice, if if you know if you've got a part that's not a service lane part that you're not going to see the next day, uh, I would definitely have my my counterman bid some freight on there. Just just so you know, I'm not saying that they put it in the cost of the part. They should definitely bid it separately so you can make an educated decision. You might send that vehicle to detail while it's waiting for that part if it's something minor. Uh, but you know, let the used car manager or the decision maker know, hey, I can have all of this stuff here. It's going to be 27 bucks. Well, that's cheaper than what I spend to keep that car in stock for one day by far. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and on top of that, that, you know, one of the things that we've noticed just, and I know I'm repeating a theme here, but none of, none of what we've talked about is going to make that wrench turn faster or that buffer buff faster. It's about the dead time in between. You, uh, one of the things that uh, we personally do for our, our customers is we consistently do reviews and identify bottlenecks and, and do write-ups for them. And what I've seen is a common theme. It's inspection and detail. Inspection and detail are always consistently um, somebody's low-hanging fruit or bottlenecks. And the one common core between both of those is a, a, di a proper dispatch process and an update just by knowing people have a certain car assigned to them, just by knowing there's work available, go ahead and take it. You can really save a lot of time. And, and so I find that those are probably the easiest uh, days to get back because that is a common theme between a lot of these stores that we review. Wow, oh, this, this has been fascinating. I, I love that um, we're, we're, we're applying the, uh, for the, for those, for those, used car people were applying the v auto uh formula to recon and we're getting to where it's a scientific efficiency play and it's you know just like you would never you know hold on to that car because you know you, you you're in love with it as a, as a used car manager um you know you know getting taking the emotion out of the equation and, and talking about just the sheer the numbers and 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 the turn time and, and you know you're your uh, your car to saving enough time over time you know over time to do an extra car is it's crazy I really appreciate this guys this has been great yeah thanks certainly thanks for having us I don't I don't know if you're wrapping up but I just want want to say thanks for the opportunity to <laughs> yes <honor>. thank you <laughs> yeah I think let, let's wrap it up we've got we've got AG and AM thank you guys so much um, uh, if you guys want the book uh, you saw that uh, you can email Anthony. Um, I don't know which one of Anthony we're emailing because you're both Anthony, but I'm sure the book will get out to somebody. And then it, it's, um, me. <laughs> <laughs> it's me. Uh, and then, like, let's continue the discussion. Um, you know, we've got the driving sales community. We can continue that discussion on. And, and um, you know, this recording will go out to everyone. It will be posted on the community. Um, just so much opportunity here that that I'm glad that that we're we're, we're having these conversations. We're getting that that word out there and that uh the dealers are seeing some success uh reducing that to to uh you know under five days it's crazy uh we appreciate it guys all right thank you so thank much thank you again
Okay. Yeah, and uh, thank you everyone out there for joining this webinar. Uh, we hope to see you on future Driving Sales webinars.